seminar this afternoon, Nehru Memorial Museum and Library, uh, on uh, Taiwan unfettered time for hard decisions. We have the pleasure of having with us today Ambassador Prabhat P. Shukla, who has been ambassador to various countries such as Singapore, Australia, and Russia. He has had a distinguished career and has also written many important things on foreign policy. It's my pleasure today to welcome him to this uh, seminar, come webinar, public lecture. We know that uh, Taiwan is, economically speaking, one of the success stories of East Asia. In the last 50 years, starting from 1960 onward, it has emerged as a developed country, which has a niche kind of position in some of the key industries, the most important of which is, of course, the semiconductor industry in which Taiwan is the world leader. But apart from this, there are many other industries in which Taiwan occupies a very important position. It is, uh, uh, of course, as I said, its per capita income is very high and it is a developed country. Now, the key question about Taiwan in the last 70 years, ever since the communist revolution in China in 1949, has been the relationship Taiwan has with China. As we all know, China has claimed Taiwan as its own territory. But Taiwan, for all practical purposes, on the other hand, is an... Taiwan is an independent, for all practical purposes, is an independent country. And okay. it's that the democratic opinion in Taiwan in the recent years has gravitated more and more towards remaining independent from the clutches of China. On the other hand, we also see that China in the post-2008 recession period has shed whatever ambiguity it had regarding the use of force in what it calls the reunification of Taiwan with China. And it has acquired a more and more belligerent position, more and more bellicose position, occasionally firing uh, missiles, violating the air space of Taiwan. Uh, in a way, testing the will of Taiwan and uh, its allies in all possible ways. This is clear uh, intimidation meant to uh, frighten Taiwan into accepting uh, a reunification, what China calls reunification, uh, with the People's Republic on the terms and conditions uh, laid down by the latter. Of course, another key element in uh, this matter is uh, the United States which uh, adopted this uh, one china policy in 1972 but also passed uh, this uh, taiwan defense act in 1979 and uh, obviously is regarded by the by the chinese mandarins as the most important uh, uh, sort of barrier uh, towards a military conquest of taiwan and its reabsorption with china now in the recent times we see that the american uh, military posture and American political posture about uh, how far it will go to the defense of Taiwan if it is attacked in the near future, especially about uh, China has been changing. And uh, President Biden has also made some important statements in this regard. I will not go into all those details further. Uh, my purpose is only to introduce the speaker and the subject. And I guess now without any further delay, I would like to invite Ambassador Prabhat Shukla to go ahead with his lecture. Welcome. Is this on? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Can you? Okay. Thank you for this opportunity to address this group and our online listeners and viewers. Uh, the reason that I tackle this issue of Taiwan, of course, is the kind of mounting uh, tensions that we are all witnessing in the region, and especially the increasing hints of resort to force by China. And what occurred to me was that most of the writings, and I suppose 
most important ones are what the Americans are saying and thinking, they all tend to be very so like, you know, do we offer more arms to Taiwan? Do we make them what they call a porcupine? Which is a rather sad metaphor because actually in the wild, lions do eat porcupines. So it isn't a very happy kind of defensive posture <laughs> that they are promoting. And it, by the way, it's the same with India too. We are also only fighting a defensive battle right now. And it struck me that actually we need to shake China out of its comfort zone. They are in a happy position where they are threatening here and threatening there and acting here and doing something else there. And the rest of us are simply saying, oh, look, you promised to do this. Oh, this is the understanding. That's the agreement. And they are violating it as they choose when it suits them. That's why I decided that we need to reflect a little on what are the options in case we decide that we are not going to be playing purely a defensive game. And that's where I want to start. Oh, you've got the article. Oh, you don't have the presentation. Oh, slides. I sent the slides. Anyway, I hope most of you have got this essay also, and have some of you, I hope, have gone through it. Now, let me see what, if I give you the projected. All right. This is why I, I always like to come early That's all I'm to make, sure. make sure that kind of things. No, no, never mind. <laughs> never mind. Okay, here we are. So now let's go. First slide, please. Why, why I've said hard decisions is because. Frankly, we have all been slack in terms of our own defense posture. That has, that has allowed China to gain a significant military strength over the, over the entire region, along its borders and in the Western Pacific. Now, here I'm, my purpose is in showing you the first and second uh, island chains. And the first one, you see how pivotal Taiwan is. The logic of the first island chain, in case uh, you don't know it, I imagine that you do. So I'll very briefly cover this. That The idea is that with this chain of islands that all are skeptical about China or even hostile to China, will prevent it from breaking through to the wider Pacific Ocean. And the second island chain is a kind of, the kind of second line of defense. But if the first one is breached, then it becomes very much harder to safeguard the second island chain and the line of defense. Next slide, please. Now, this is where actually the position of the United States began to change. And notice the date, 27 June 1950, two days after the Korean War began. And here he is saying, the punchline is, I have ordered the Seventh Fleet to prevent any attack on Formosa. The rest were already covered by various defense 
policy statements by the Americans. Formosa and Korea were the two countries that they had not covered in their statements. There's a very famous remark by Dean Acheson where he, where he mentioned all the American commitments, but he forgot to, or he said he forgot, others have a different take on it, didn't mention Korea. And shortly after that, the Korean War began. And therefore, at that stage, they also hadn't made any commitments to Formosa. So they were already fighting the war in Korea, and they added Formosa. This is the significance of the statement of June 1950. It marked a new approach by the United States to the region. Next, please. Now, this, I suppose you are you're all well aware of the kind of aggressive posture that China has been adopting. And of course, it should concern us more than anybody else. And uh, I, I just hope that we are going to pay a little more attention to our defense posture, which has been neglected uh, since the early 90s. And as I said, the defense, we have all been on the defense so far, and it's time to think of an alternative approach, but with adequate military preparation. This is vital. If we are going to knock China out of its comfort zone, we have to be prepared for a pushback by the PLA, because I believe the PLA is out of control. The more the Chinese leaders say that the party must control the gun, the more you can be sure that the reverse is actually happening. Next, please. Now, it's a legacy country. It's one of those countries that has con continued unchanged since 1911. Those of you who read Tsai Ing-wen's speech on the 110th anniversary of the ROC, it was about a week ago, uh, she marked the 110th anniversary. So she's drawing a straight line from the 1911 revolution, which ushered in the Republic of China. Now, the important thing is that the ROC has been a major player in global politics from 1911 till 1949, when it was defeated in the civil war and Chiang Kai-shek and company fled to the island. So here I'm going to cover four issues. One, its sovereignty. Second, its membership of the UN. Third, the claim on Tibet and the McMahon line the rejection of the McMahon line and the its role in the at the origins of the current nine dash line in the South China Sea proclaimed by China, which is really at the root of all the tension in the South China Sea. Next, please. Now, the sovereignty issue is really the starting point of everything else. The uh, Chinese today claim that their, their, that their position on Taiwan as a part of the People's Republic is based on a wartime declaration declared in 1943 by three leaders who very modestly call themselves the three great allies, namely Churchill, Roosevelt, and Chiang Kai-shek. And they undertook that after the Japanese were defeated and the war was over, they would ensure the return of those islands and territories that were taken over by the Japanese since the start of the First World War to the Republic of China, which included Manchuria and Taiwan and the Pescadores. Now, the question is, who is the Republic of China? Because Taiwan, as we know, is the Republic of China. They celebrated their 110th anniversary just about a week ago. And this was a very serious argument between the British and the Americans. The Americans at this stage were led by John Foster Dulles. This is an important point because Dulles was not the Secretary of State at this point of time. But he had been brought in by President Truman because Dean Acheson, who was the Secretary of State, was known to be an Anglophile. 
and he had been pushing for accommodating the People's Republic under British influence. This is a, this is a subject which I am still trying to unravel exactly why the British were so soft on communist China. I believe I have some answers, which I'll be glad to share with you. But the point is that this was handed over to, to Dulles as a matter of deliberate choice by President Truman, so that when he negotiated the San Francisco Treaty, Acheson was really sidelined, even though he was Secretary of State. And it was Acheson's efforts that made sure that the San Francisco Treaty, which was the negotiations were completed in 1951, it entered into force in 1952, that the final disposition of Taiwan and the Pescadores was left open. And in fact, in the negotiations which Dulles and uh, Churchill had, by this time Churchill had returned as prime minister, Dulles suggested that any moves regarding the final disposition of Formosa would require a reference to the people of the island. British did not agree, and so the whole thing was left in limbo. Next, please. The second issue is the expulsion of Taiwan, or Formosa, Republic of China. I'm using the three terms interchangeably from the UN. Now, Article 6 of the UN Charter is quite clear that a member can only be expelled on the recommendation of the Security Council. Uh, the way this was done, actually, was that all the action was in the General Assembly. And this was a matter, I think, of deliberate choice by the four or five major powers that were involved in it. So all the action was in the General Assembly, where no one, no country has a veto. The Americans at this time, please remember, Kissinger had completed his secret visit to China, and they were preparing at this stage for Nixon's summit visit in early 1952, uh, 1972. And so the matter went to the General Assembly. And the first move the Americans made was to have it declared an important question. This is a specific term under Article 18 of the Charter, which means if it is deemed to be an important question, it will require a two thirds majority for any proposal to carry. This was defeated by a simple majority. And then the Americans put in another resolution suggesting that both the People's Republic and the Republic could be members. And this was also voted down. And then finally, the resolution moved by Albania. At this point of time, Albania and China were very close. Both of the two communist parties were arguing against the CPSU the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. And so their resolution was to expel the Chiang Kai-shek representation. And the, that vote was carried again by a simple majority. This is important to remember, you know, because now when we are talking about India joining as a permanent member, and we have a group of four that is doing this, Quad seem to be the rage right now, this squad is actually India, Germany, Japan, Brazil. We are four applicants for permanent membership. China is now arguing that this must go to the General Assembly as an important question. And therefore, we need a two-thirds majority. Whereas in their own time, they were perfectly happy with a simple majority. This point needs to be emphasized by us. And the important thing is that the UN Charter still lists the Republic of China as a permanent member of the Security Council, which means that the presence of the People's Republic is a violation of the UN Charter. And in my view, this is a subject matter which should be referred to the International Court of Justice. Now, the International Court of Justice uh, adjudicates only those matters that are moved by a sovereign state. Taiwan is no longer deemed a sovereign state, so they cannot do it. And therefore, it'll have to be some other group of 
UN member states, or there is one more line of attack, and that is that the ICJ can issue advisories on a reference made by an NGO. Now this I think should be easier and the advisory will have almost the same effect as an as a judgment. So oh yeah, thanks. So this is this is one of the proposals that I think we really need to be working on in all the various quads and all that we are we are members of. Next please. Now we come to the most important thing from our point of view, which is the McMahon line. It was the Republic of China that rejected the outcome of the Simla conference. It was not the PRC. The PRC has simply adopted the same positions. And its objection was based on a disagreement over the line of the inner of inner Tibet vis-a-vis -vis the rest of China. Now the interesting thing is that the Republic of China accepted an almost identical agreement to the Simla Convention in respect of Mongolia with Russia as a third party. It's called the Treaty of Kyakta, signed in 1915. And you know, it's very painful for, for me to see where we have reached. In 1911, 12, 13, Tibet and Mongolia were in identical position with vis-a-vis -vis mainland China. Mongolia's patron was the Russian Empire, then the Bolsheviks. Tibet's misfortune was that its patrons were the British Empire, British Indian Empire, and then Nehru's government. So you see what a, what a marked difference there is. Mongolia is a sovereign state member of the UN, Tibet is suffering under the jackboot of the PLA. Very painful for me to reflect upon this. But I think Taiwan or the Republic of China can make amends even now by retrospectively changing its position on the McMahon line. The UK has done that recently, well not recently, 2008. They changed their position on the issue of suzerainty and sovereignty and said that really there's no difference it's the same thing which of course gladdened the hearts of the leaders in beijing but here could be i think a very powerful rejoinder from the republic of china to say yes they accept the macmahon line and their objection to the inner tibet boundary is now moot they have nothing to do with tibet anymore anyway so they can most certainly acknowledge the McMahon line. Now there's a background to this. In 1959, uh, Chiang Kai-shek agreed, this is after the Dalai Lama fled to India. Sorry. Okay. When he fled to India, Chiang Kai-shek made a statement back in 1959 saying that if he were able to unite China once again, he would give Tibetans the right of self-determination. But at the same time, in 1962, during the war, when America moved to recognize the McMahon line, the Republic of China lobbied very strongly against such a move by the Americans. If you read uh, Galbraith's, uh, what's it called? The An Ambassador's Journal, you will see a lurid description of how he managed to get this thing done so that the Americans recognize the McMahon line as the boundary between India and Tibet. Next, please. Now, here is another of those puzzles which will lead us back to Britain and, and Chiang Kai-shek. Nehru recognized Tibet as an independent country at the time of the Asian Relations Conference. This was organized in April 1947, before independence. But, I mean, everyone knew independence was coming and Nehru was the coming prime minister. The Republic of China did make some protests about this, but Nehru brushed them aside, and he insisted that Tibet was an independent country. Once the communists took over, he switched 180 degrees, and he says, actually, communist China, China has sovereignty over Tibet. 
they initially used the word suzerainty but then quickly abandoned it now my uh, my research i hate that word it's too big a word my 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 reading and reflection right now leads me to one working hypothesis which is you know chanka shek visited india in 1952 42 during the second world war and he after after his talks with nehru and gandhi and jinnah and the governor general and sundry others made a statement saying that britain should give independence to india to the arch imperialist churchill this was anathema and since then the relations between the british and the republic of china have been poisoned and that is why the british were among the first to recognize communist china as early as 1950 almost immediately after india did and i believe that the relationship here because nehru was very closely guided by the british in his early years in fact till the very end but certainly in the early years and that is why i suspect that it was the british who influenced his views on tibet as a part of china and of course the important thing when we talk about all this is when i say that the roc is now in a position to change its position on the simla convention macma online and tibet in 2017 the republic of china dissolved the mongolia tibet affairs commission this was a commission which they were managing under the pretense that mongolia and tibet were all part of the republic of china when when they dissolved it it was a signal that they were adopting more realistic positions and it's no coincidence that the first proposal to dissolve this came under chen shui bian and the job was completed under tsai ing wen both dpp leaders next please 11 dash line now you probably all of you know that the that the the philippines took this court this issue to the court of arbitration uh, arguing that the people's republic claim on the nine, nine dash line uh, i'll uh, could we just go to the next slide for a minute no no next one yeah this is the original 11 dash line pushed forward by the republic of china in 1947 they've been talking about it since 1937 but this was as far as i know the first map that they put out back in 1947 it has 11 dashes the the top two northwest were removed by mao zedong as a gesture of solidarity with vietnam and they made it a nine dash line now when the philippines took uh, go to the next slide please this is the nine dash line and you see how absurd it is they are claiming uh, islands that are very clearly far far away from their territory and much closer to all of those in the first island chain now when the philippines moved the permanent court of arbitration the uh, chinese of course rejected the jurisdiction and they put out their but they did put out a rebuttal they didn't link it to the arbitration issue but put out a something called a position paper and in that they referred to two bases for their claim to the entirety of the south china sea one they said they had explored it 2000 years ago very nice i think all of us explored it 2000 years ago the second was the reference to the 11 dash line that this actually originates from the 11 dash line now my point is again the roc today has absolutely nothing at stake in the 11 dash line and therefore they should repudiate it they have a they have a claim to the taiping island and it is said in the uh, taiwanese media that the reason that they are also upholding 
the uh, 9-11-9 posture is that they don't want to compromise their claim to the Taiping Island. But I believe that there are ways around this and uh, there are th their claim to the Taiping Island. The permanent court of arbitration called it a rock. So that's one of the reasons that the Taiwanese didn't like that judgment. But I think there's a way, there's a work around here. And once you reject the 11 dash line, you have undermined the basis for the nine dash line. So I think this is the other angle of attack, which will again undermine whatever claims China may have, which are utterly false anyway, to this region. Next, please. Yeah, okay, I think I've, I've covered most of this, so we can, we can move on. Now we come to the uh, policy options. I will repeat again that in order to implement any of the ideas emerging out of this recounting of the Republic of China and its history and its strategy, the first thing is that we have to be prepared for a very strong pushback from China, which means we have to prepare our defenses. All, all the countries involved must prepare their defenses very, very carefully. It's interesting that yesterday, according to reports, um, uh, President Biden has made a statement at a, um, at a gathering of certain people. It's called a town hall meeting uh, organized by CNN, where twice he was asked would America go to the defense of Taiwan if it were attacked? And twice he said, yes, it will. And of course, his own colleagues have undermined that statement by saying that there is no change in America's position. But I think this is something that we need to take on board because it's a very significant remark coming from President Biden. Um, he's not always all there, but I think this was probably prepared and the fact that he stuck to it twice suggests that there is some serious intent behind it. So as I said, the first thing is that we have to work on a common understanding on these points, because I, I think all of us get a clear sense that there is growing alarm in the region and beyond at what China is doing, especially the muscle flexing that we are seeing from China. So we have uh, last week, I think, even the European Parliament adopted a resolution hinting at self-determination for Taiwan. The exact words they have used are that any change in the status must be with the agreement of the people of Taiwan. And that vote was carried by 580 in favor, 26 against. That's the kind of public opinion that is building up across the world. So I think we need a little more active diplomacy, not only India, but all the other countries that are concerned, including the ROC. And with adequate diplomatic and military preparation, uh, we can move forward on these points. The, for example, when uh, Nixon and Kissinger were dealing with the People's Republic, Nixon wrote a letter to Chiang Kai-shek saying that they would never denounce the Mutual Defense Treaty. And of course, after Jimmy Carter came to office, he did denounce the treaty. And there's an interesting point here because the denunciation of the treaty was done by executive order which is really not legal because the treaty had been ratified by the Senate, which is what is required under their constitution. So if it is to be repealed, it is up to the Senate to repeal it, not to the president by executive order. And this was taken to the Supreme Court, which at that point of time simply held back and said it would not pass any judgment on it. In other words, the the plaint is still pending, even though the senators who moved it are no more. But I think this is a good time to revive it and get 
the mutual defense treaty get some sort of clarity on what the mutual defense treaty status is today next please and in return i think you know taiwan is so frequently seen as a victim and it is a victim no doubt about it but the result of that is that we don't put any requirements on what taiwan should do in order to win the kind of support and commitment which it wants which it needs and which it deserves so i would say one of the things that they can do quite easily is retrospectively recognize the mac mahon line second approach some some group of countries or some ngos can approach the international court of justice and get a decision or a advisory on the manner in which the roc was expelled from the un i have no doubt that any reading of the charter will uphold the plaint uh this i have talked about already the revival of the mutual defense treaty and a denunciation of the roc by the 11 dash line and as most of you would know taiwan has also applied for membership of the cptpp this is a comprehensive and progressive trans pacific partnership it's the old tpp minus the us because the us unilaterally pulled out of it this would be a i think an excellent tactical move and a reward to the roc for the kind of action that we anticipate that they will take next please well this i have touched upon almost all through um really yeah yeah okay uh now uh, you know the the media have somehow built up the prc as some kind of unbeatable monster so you know the only thing you can do is negotiate your terms of surrender but that isn't true their economy is on is in bad trouble uh, look what's happening to their property sector and that is about 30% of their gdp and uh, a setback there will have negative effects throughout the economy the problem is that and uh, you see the diplomatic isolation of the country apart from russia really and russia has been pushed into this because of the western hostility towards russia some of it russia deserves some of it it doesn't but it has left them with no option but to embrace china us policies unfortunately are looking a little wobbly and we are hearing all sorts of messages coming out of them but i think give them a little more time i think they are um i was going to say they are moving in the right direction i'm not sure about that uh, their uh, usdr has talked about a recoupling which didn't sound good to me but let's see how it goes but um, i think there is enough leverage in the united states to be able to hold the line and as i said just yesterday president biden has made quite a firm declaration which we need to encourage and build upon um asean will be the hard nut to crack but i think it's something that we do need to work on at least some members would be willing if not openly then at least tacitly would be willing to go along with this and i think as the process moves forward and succeeds it will attract greater support from asean next please hello we are done thank you very much thank you ambassador shukla for that uh, uh, very insightful lecture which has uh, focused on certain points which uh, nobody talks about and uh, i'm sure that uh, there is a lot of stuff that needs to be discussed uh, from the view point of international law also it will be an interesting topic uh, for uh, the practitioners of international law because the nuances that you have presented of course they need to be studied and uh, taken further we are now open to uh, questions and comments from uh, all those who are present uh, i request everybody to be brief in questions 
Please uh, use the mic. It's so informative and educative, and it you know fill in some of the blanks which I was trying to fill. I did a small write-up on China, and I was tracing the history that why China has reached that stage today, coming from 49th. And I was trying to repeat in that okay, what the West did to put China on that pedestal. And this whole explanation going back to that of, you know, with Taiwan and earlier countries comes to that. One of the reasons I see is in this Taiwan question you raised that why the British were so close coming to the communist China is, uh, and I'm telling it with my research, I have some recommendation, I'll be uh, doing more on that. And it goes to the Second World War phase also of the Japanese fight and uh, the INA fight over there and the INA having a big trading headquarters at Shanghai at that time and the tie-ups which are coming, there's more in the Shanghai archives. I think Priya Darshi uh, Mukherjee's book must be uh, carrying out some more. Now, my questions are specific to here. One is I can't understand that why, like China and like Taliban, or I may add the third to it, Pakistan, historically it has been proved that they have not kept any of their ties, their promises, their treaties, or anything. And why still again, these big diggers of diplomacy in the world, they keep believing on it, that China has said that they will move from Galwan, you know, two kilometers back, and they will do it from this and that and all. That's not that. I have an understanding of China, dating back to what Napoleon had said about China way back in 1812, that it's a sleeping dragon, and don't wake her up. Otherwise, this dragon will shake the world. And that's what the dragon is doing today. And the crucial question now comes is that when all these alliances, when NATO was made, Seattle was made and all, is it not possible for India now to take an initiative that all the neighboring countries of China, which have been you know, persecuted by China in one way or the other, particularly in relation to the boundary question, starting from Vietnam to uh, if you go even Russia, that side, or uh, Mongolia, or Nepal, all these countries, to make a thing together that everyone should know that they can move jointly and China can't fight all the fronts. I had said in one of my write-ups that it is time to have such an alliance and put China back into the China walls, which was the original China. Because if China talks of maps and all, then the earliest China original is the China wall. You know, beyond that, out is the lands are served by China. Uh, from all others. And then this whole Chinese threat which is coming every second day. They very cleverly used a biological weapon. I am aware of that. When that was ending, they brought in Galwan. When Galwan is winding, they brought in Taliban. They are out there to do some mischief or the other which is going to be over there. They are not going to sit tight or keep quiet. And again, now this Taiban, Taliban, this side. So again, again, now it's on... Taiwan again and Japan again and doing that aspect. But still I see that China knows this thing very well. That whatever threatening gestures China may make, China can't win an ultimate war. Which whom it's a make. And the world also knows that. In a war situation, India also knows that. China also knows that. Now when these things are equally known to both sides, that China can't win a war, or we can't do it, China, whatever is destruction is going on to. Why do still these world leaders try to play cat China and go behind it? And the only last point, the so last reason I find behind it is, okay, if China has to be restricted, then the dominance of economic lurements and economic profit gains of multinationals, they have to give it up. Otherwise, America is doomed. Forget India. India will still survive. Thank you. We'll take two, three more questions before you answer. <laughs> Fine. Yes, any other questions? Yes, please come ahead and use the mic. Uh, thank you, you very much. Introduce for... yourself. Okay, I'm Varada. I'm a junior research fellow at Teen Murti. Uh, thank you for thought provoking uh, presentation, sir. Uh, China, which is going on uh, dismantling, more than dismantling, which disrespects all international institutions or rather uses them to suit their own agenda. How 
how does going to icj can serve our purpose that's one and second uh, related a uh, dehyphenating prc from people of china can that be a diplomatic tool that can be uh, of any use if you can uh, any other the questions Thank yes you. please go ahead aman Yeah. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, so uh, my question is about the Indo-Pacific uh, because uh, as far as U.S. is concerned, its engagement uh, with the Asian security system is basically through the hub and spoke system. And now, uh, you know, where uh, U.S. tries to engage bilaterally with these three, particularly Republic of Korea, then ta Taiwan, and then Japan, where there is no engagement among these three, but there is direct engagement with the U.S. system. Now, do you think that it's a time, you know, given all these uh, assertiveness that China is doing, that it's time for the U.S. to renounce that spoke hub and spoke system and create some kind of a broader security framework, you know, in, in the Indo-Pacific construct, where we will engage with these three directly? Well, these three will also be, you know, will be permitted to engage directly with each other, not just with the United States. So is there any chance that this, this system can be created, sir? Thank you. All right. I think you can now attempt answers right. before we take more questions. OK. Why do people believe China? I give up on that one, I tell you honestly. Because, you know, talking about India, for example, it's on, I think. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's okay, okay. Uh, you know, we can go back to 1954 when we made all these unilateral concessions. You know, Tibet is yours, and we did another agreement, which very few know about, in October 1954, allowing Tibet and the People's Republic to trade through India, their logistics were so bad, we could have actually knocked them out of Tibet militarily. People don't know this, but they were in extremely straitened conditions at that time. From then to now, you see, when we had the Kailash Heights and the Chinese wanted us out, we unilaterally pulled back, knowing fully well that the hardest issue was in Debsang. And that was the leverage that we had. Why did we do that? I can tell you, I wasn't around. I was only three years old in 1954. So I couldn't poke my nose in others' affairs. But this time, I was old enough to poke my nose in others' affairs. And I did make, it, make the point to a couple of my friends who are taking some decisions. And I said, why are you doing this? Fine, you got an agreement, signed, sealed but not delivered. You deliver when you've got your package deal covering Debsang. And you see what is the result now? They're saying there's nothing to discuss. You're left high and dry. Why does this happen? Really, I, I don't get it. I don't get it. I, I can just shrug my shoulders. Now, invite countries to work together. Actually, I think efforts have been made but nobody wants to be seen especially in ASEAN nobody wants to be seen to be ganging up quote unquote on China I think that is the real deterrent because China has successfully bilateralized all the relationships in the region it's partly it's partly money and it's partly military the, the 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 implication of their heavy military superiority over all the ASEAN countries. Russia is a country worth working with. Um, but you know there now there is this territorial issue that has come up between Russia and the uh, and NATO and Russia and the EU, which is the Crimea. And history tells us that territorial issues are very, very difficult to overcome. And we've seen it in our own case with China. 
it's the same. Russia will never give up Crimea, or at least not willingly. And it's the same you see Russia, Japan on the Kurils. Back in 1956, they reached an agreement. It has still not been implemented. So those are very difficult things to do. Um, but look, I think the Quad is a beginning. And as I said, if we can move forward successfully, I have a feeling we will probably attract some more support, at least tacitly. Um, China can't win a war. Yeah, I think so. And I'm glad that we proved that once again in Galwan. But I do wish we would talk a little more openly about how we have actually given them a bloody nose. Somehow when you see any, our messaging isn't very good, to put it very mildly. And whenever you see any write-up on Galwan, you only hear that India lost 20 soldiers. Nobody says China lost 45. And that's because we don't say it. Until we start saying it, at least then they can say, and India says China lost 45. Fine, good enough. But for some reason, our, our messaging is very hesitant and self-effacing. I don't I, I, I'm, I'm trying to get that changed, pushing as hard as I can. Um, how will the ICJ help? Look, in the final analysis, the currency of international relations is power. And unless all of this is backed up by power, nothing is going to change. But having all this back up, the positions that we are proposing will be a great addition to, our, to the legitimacy of the positions that we are taking. Unless they are challenged and at least legally, technically overcome, there is always this question mark, who's right, who's wrong? So therefore, I think an appeal to the ICJ on what happened in 1971 would be a, a major shift as far as the legitimacy or the illegitimacy of China's presence in the Security Council will be addressed. And you know, for me, particularly, this is, this is a big deal because the very process that they took advantage of to get into the Security Council, they're now denying us. And our claim is as good as theirs was in 1971, even better. So that's, that's the kind of thing that you get when you move these kind of international bodies. The word, I guess, is legitimacy. And then you have to back it up with military, diplomatic, social, economic pressure to achieve the outcome you want. De-hyphenate the PRC from the people, great idea. I think it's already been done, meaning the PRC, uh, the CPC, or as in the West it's called the CCP, they call it CPC, has, in my opinion, zero legitimacy in China. I believe the last shreds of legitimacy were destroyed in Tiananmen Square in 1989. And I think the point needs to be made in the same way that Ronald Reagan did with the Soviet Union. I, I agree with you that this would be a very helpful approach. But you know, in all this, I must say, you must first be ready for a military pushback because the PLA, frankly, is calling the shots in the PRC today. And they are very trigger happy. They're seeing all kinds of studies being done in the US, which show that in a war, China will prevail. There was a very good comment from uh, one of the uh, people who did one of the assessments. And she wrote saying that, you know, we deliberately bias these studies in order to show, highlight the weaknesses of the American military posture. So when you get an outcome that China will prevail, it's not the reality. It is deliberately biased in such a way that we wake up and say, okay, these are the weaknesses that we have to address. But the PLA folk are taking it as literal and they're getting more and more expansionist. 
Indo-Pacific bilateral only time to come together. Yes, I think I think that's true. And I think the Quad is one example of how this is being done. But you know the um, uh, the bilateral frictions. Firstly, I don't think there are too many bilateral frictions between Taiwan and Japan. I think they're getting along like a house on fire. Uh, there are frictions between the ROK and Japan. That's not because the Americans are holding either of the two sides back. No, that's because ROK, for reasons that I disagree with, are deliberately building up barriers to understanding with or accommodation with Japan. See this whole thing about um, Second World War atrocities. I mean, how long are going to be are they going to beat that drum? And the Japanese have, according to me, issued two major apologies, but uh, evident, and they have given monetary compensation. But according to the ROK, that's still not good enough. Uh, maybe this is one of those areas where the Quad can work together to try and bring the two together. I think we have some questions from our online uh, friends also. If there is any question, please go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, sir. And thank you, uh, Am Ambedkar Shukla. And I don't have any questions. Uh, can you hear me, sir? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead with your well, I have some sort of observations only, not questions as such. OK. Uh, as for your point that why the UK was uh, lenient and soft on uh, the, the PRC in the 1940s. So, well, yeah, one point we have highlighted, and one I would like to contribute that perhaps more pressing region was the Hong Kong. Was Hong Kong? Its interest in Hong Kong. But in, in my reading, that also uh, that also comes out. So maybe you can give your comment on that whether the Hong Kong was the region or not. Number one and number two, and that uh, the yeah, it's a very valid point that Taiwan should retrospectively recognize. McMahon line and of course the South China the its claims on South China Sea because it will show that Taiwan is different from China and it it has a it has a clear cut different national identity and it and interests but that is easier said than done because we have to look at what is what is happening what is the nature of their domestic politics because uh, it's a the the question of Taiwan's national identity is still is far from being settled yet. Within, within Taiwan, the KMT is still a potent force then that basically identifies with the, its pan-China vision, pan-China view, and basically that is the view vision that has written the ROC's constitution that wrote ROC's constitution in 1945-6, and it is still in in the force. So a lot of domestic consensus has to be created, and normally we and we accept and endorse the democratic progressive parties views on face value and that might not be the case within Taiwanese society that I would like to say. And the third point is we definitely do see a lot of surge in international opinion in favor of Taiwan, particularly in the West and more particularly in the US and the US-Taiwan relations. But uh, I would say that US-Taiwan relations are a function of Sino-US relations, US-China US relations. So more than so that what what will happen in U.S. Taiwan relations and in the Taiwan uh, Taiwan Europe or Taiwan West relations or Taiwan's relations with the U U.S. allies? So more than keeping, of course, we should track their relations, but then we should track also what is happening in China U.S. relations. And I would not be more explicit than uh, than this. So, uh, of course, everybody is wiser than me, so thank you. You will get the, uh, the I point what I'm trying to say. One more question. Thank you. One more question. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Are you referring to me, sir? I'm Amit Gupta. Yeah, anyone who has a question now? Yes, please. Uh, I'm Amit Gupta. Uh, uh, thank you so much. I, I would, on the onset, I would like to congratulate uh, Ambassador Shukla uh, for such a wonderful presentation. So my question is, sir, you have put all the things so simply and so very well. Uh, available in public domain, why the countries, uh, why the big countries they are not acting upon uh, upon the the suggestions that you have just made 
Thank you. Is there any other question? Mr. Gautam, Gautam Sen, you are muted, sir. You have to unmute yourself. We can't hear you. No, something else to matter. All right, uh, we'll come back to him later. In the meantime, there is a question from here from Professor Makhanlal. Go easy, boss. <laughs> please don't do like that, please. No, it's a very, very simple. Uh, I hope there is no underground concert. <laughs> <laughs> no, that we don't do. It. <laughs> I have 40 years of diplomacy. <laughs> Not very far from conspiracy. <laughs> uh, one is a, uh, is a very small question. Another is a very brief explanation, if you will permit that for that. Absolutely. So, question is very simple, sir, that a treaty is signed between two sovereign countries. I mean, defense treaty between America and Formosa or RPC, whatever you want yes. to say. Yes. And Senate approves it. Yes. But then it is revoked by executive order, what may be what the, may be the that's, reason? That's curious. curious. What, may, what, may be, what may be the reason Senate and then Supreme Court both keeping quiet? It's not a small matter in terms of diplomatic treaties and all that. And you being in thick of it, just to know what could have been. Second is explanation for two minutes uh, about Kapil's question that all these countries, South China Sea and all that, they should come together. A very small thing, which Ambassador Shukla probably recall, there was a, when uh, the Silk Route issue began, there was never a Silk Route before 18th century. It was al Uttarapath and all that. And when China began the Silk Route diplomacy, in 2007, I wrote to the Ministry of Culture, giving a project that Silk Route is ours. Uttarapad. But now that China has appropriated and UN has recognized it, there is an alternative to this to counter it. And that was, I called the ocean route. And this name was given, sir, Mausam. Initially in 2007-8, when I put this proposal to Ministry of Culture, I was, I mean, I, I'm saying I, because somewhere I was deeply involved into this, with whole issue. Initially 13 crores was allotted. Government involved to office department that this project should go ahead and three crores rupees to each government departments were allotted. I am not going to name them. I, I can tell you what they are, but you may recall Shuklaji. Secretary was so upset. We had discussed the matter with foreign ministry. I was deeply involved in uh, NSA to take interest in all that. Secretary became so frustrated government departments not working. He asked me whether I can take over the entire project and 114 crores subsidiary besides 13, whole thing should be transferred to VIF with many of us to be involved. And in fact, even the first conference was planned of 39 countries who were to be involved in Mosam. And these country, nine countries were the one we had trade in relationship right from Harappan time till today. Because after all, right from Papua New Guinea and Japan, up to Nairobi, Kenya, and all that, with all the Middle Eastern countries and all that, we had the trading relationship, and there is enough record in their countries also. But this was all <clears throat> nothing being done. And now I, once in a while, I hear about Mosam when I'm invited to chair some lecture on the Mosam, give India's contact with, you know, this country, that country, but that is where we, you know, I don't know what word you sent me today. We are very good in mismanaging everything. That was the clarification I wanted to give. Efforts were made, but finally, yeah. now nobody knows what is happening with Muslim. Now, oh, let me see. I can't read my own handwriting. I don't know what I what the first question was. Does anyone remember? Uh, the first question was, uh, you know, he actually more or less uh, agreed with you, but 
But he said that uh, Taiwan. Why are people acting on it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, my my answer is on two vectors. The first is that you know developing a policy requires a collection of minds to work together on what is desirable and feasible. I, I'm hoping that the kind of things that I'm writing are a contribution to what should be done. A lot of people are worried about what is happening in Taiwan. Many, many more are worried about the direction that the People's Republic is taking. But apart from, you know, a purely defensive stance, and sometimes not even that, very few have gone beyond that. There was an article yesterday in the Wall Street Journal by the former US NSA, uh, John Bolton, where he has brought up one or two of these points. For example, I think he has said that uh, the U.S. should recognize Taiwan as a sovereign country. Okay, now that's step one. But there are many other steps that have to be taken. And only then will we be able to see off this aggressive country that, has, that really needs to be restrained and brought into the mainstream of normal diplomacy. So I think we are making the first, we are taking the first few steps, but it is a race against time. So I hope that we are able to push this forward. And I think India really has a role to play. We have two separate quads now, the one in the Indo-Pacific, one in the in West Asia. I think we really do need to be pushing some of these ideas. Um, I'm hoping that somebody in in the various departments is also looking at all these options and working on it. Uh, about the mutual defense treaty, the Senate actually did take it up. There were a group of senators led by the legendary Barry Goldwater and Orrin Hatch, and I think four others who made a plaint in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court actually ducked its role. The Supreme Court just said that this is on, it went through various stages, you know, I mean, lower court, appeal court, Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court, when it came to, to their level, they just bounced it back to the appeals court and said it's for them to, to take a view. We are not sure about the jurisdictional aspects of this issue, which is why I'm saying that it's time to revive it. And, you know, today, if you re, if you see the resolutions being passed in the Senate in favor of Taiwan, all of them have 90 plus senators in support. So I think there will be a very large group of senators of both parties who will be willing to revive this issue. And I think that's a good legal way of breaking this logjam. Yes. Dr. Panda, please go ahead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ambassador uh, Sukla, I was very impressed. I read your uh, an article in full with keen interest, and I was very impressed about the historical background they have given. Uh, but uh, I felt, and let me confess, uh, that there are several gaps which I noticed. Uh, if you don't mind, I would like to. No, I would. I'd like to hear them. Uh, and, and I will try to become as candid as possible. Please, please. Uh, even though I have several points, uh, yeah, several comments, I will maybe limit to three or four, which, which I feel the major ones. Uh, my area of uh, field is basically actually on Japan. Uh, Japan, in your talk, you hardly mentioned there is a major gap. Because if we uh, see the latest uh, uh, Japan Defense White Paper released uh, in a couple of months ago, Japan for the I mean Taiwan for the first time has been mentioned in the Japan Defense White Paper, and uh, this the Chinese have reacted very strongly. Uh, in the uh, during the uh, Biden and uh, Suga uh, summit, I think last April, again in the joint statement which was issued, 
Taiwan, 41st time was mentioned. Since 1969. Yes. So this is a major yes. uh, yeah. point which uh, I think uh, we should not overlook. Uh, the other point, you would talked about the International Court of Justice. Uh, the Philippines first went to the court against the Chinese claim on the South China Sea and uh, got a verdict in its favor. But let us also not forget the, the verdict of the, uh, the, the International Court of Justice is not binding. They, it, it lacks enforcing authority and the Chinese know, know about it. So no wonder they just you know, you know, you know, dismiss in the dustbin. So, so when you talked about the you know, Security Council resolution and also referred that the case can be referred to uh, the International Court of you know, Arbitration, same thing, we, uh, even if suppose somebody goes there and then we uh, fight uh, you know, for justice, the result will not be bi uh, uh, binding and it, will, it cannot be enforced. So, uh, uh, so that is uh, one more uh, point that I wanted to mention. Then uh, when, while talking about the ASEAN, now uh, very serious doubts are being raised about the centrality of ASEAN as a successful regional organization. Because uh, within, within the ASEAN, that there are also certain countries uh, who are very close to China, Cambodia, Laos, and of course Myanmar. And Myanmar's uh, geographical location is so uh, significant for both India and uh, China that uh, uh, my, Myanmar, uh, even though it is under the military rule, uh, we have been engaging because of our own strategic, uh, um, I would say, uh, interest or compulsion or, or whatever reward uh, you may use. Similarly, uh, China also, uh, uh, you know, because of its hostile or maybe difficult relations with us, also would like to be closer to Myanmar so that it can you know, have its presence there. As regards Japan, Japan has been uh, uh, economically engaging with Myanmar even you know, for uh, decades. So uh, it has uh, hugely invested uh, in, in Taiwan, uh, in, in Myanmar, and it will be very difficult for Japan to withdraw. The latest is uh, after the military coup in the Myanmar on 1st uh, in February, uh, the ASEAN actually has been very, very ineffective. The, the, uh, the EU, uh, uh, United States, the American, uh, the European Union, they have imposed uh, uh, certain sanctions, but then the ASEAN has been very reluctant until, until last 15, when uh, uh, in their, uh, uh, they have, uh, they are going to have a summit meeting on 28th of this month. And, uh, for the first time, the, the, the Janta is not being invited. So they, are, they, have, they, they have decided to you know, you know, invite one non-political person. So, 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 so uh, if we keep this in mind, what is there we can expect from uh, ASEAN, so, so far as South China Sea is concerned? Uh, amongst the 10 ASEAN you know, um, member countries, I, I, I see only one country, that is uh, Vietnam, which can have some, you know, uh, uh, say and, and position. So these are all some points that I would like to mention, which maybe, yeah. and also one more point, uh, sorry, last, last point. You talked about uh, Japan, the, uh, Korea, Japan, China relations. See, uh, Japan has you know, the territorial disputes with Russia, uh, the historical, the shadow of history, I would say, you know, uh, with uh, China uh, and South Korea. So these are not so easy to go away. You know, we might we may just talk that uh, uh, even even Taiwan also was under the Japanese rule. But then at, uh, now there is no question of you know history, you know, hurting the relationship and uh, the comfort women issue, you know, uh, and also the there is a, there is a court verdict uh, in uh, Korea uh, demanding that the Japanese uh, must you know pay uh, compensation for the. Um, you know, workers during the Korean uh, rule. So this also again, again another uh, you know irritant. Just is you know signed visit. That is it. That is a very real problem for the both China and Japan, uh, China and South Korea. So these are all very very complicated actually issues. It's not simple one. All right. And lastly, I would like to request you to draw three scenarios on the security front. 
centering on Taiwan. And, the, and, and the, what could be the you know, worst case scenario? Thank you very much. Would you like to say? And one thing, please. Please be clear. See, I am very clear in my understanding that China is now more confident and more determined after the newfound allies with Turkey, Taliban, and Pakistan. Pakistan was an alien and applied. But I am very clear that they have an understanding that dividing parts of the world, you go this side, we go this side, and that's why the entire silence on the Ulgar issue by these all so-called uh, fanatic uh, Islamic countries on this issue. And second thing I'd like to say, that when we are talking of these legalistic documents and all these things, what stops us from revolting our stand and calling Tibet as, Pak occup uh, as China occupied territory? Why do we say we have our borders with China? Historically, our border was never with China. Why don't we say Indo-Tibetan border to resolve the issue? Why is the government hesitant in that? And lastly, I will say, sir, one of the reasons when it is said that we are hesitant, that why things don't count, come and clearly, my experience shows that there are so deep-rooted pro-China elements, not pro-communist elements, I'll say pro-China elements, that even our opposition leaders today speak the language of China and question China when it comes to Indian nation. Thank you. Uh, would you like to add anything or would you like to respond to anything? Yeah, so these are more like comments. Yeah, these, these are mainly comments. Anything so, you want to No, I, I take on board your point about Japan and that Japan needs fuller treatment. Actually, my uh, maybe you can help me since you since you study Japan. I am handicapped right now <clears throat> by a lack of data on the Japanese economy. I've been looking for information for for hard data. <clears throat> Sorry, on the Japanese recovery after the war. So if you can. You know, give me some URLs or sources where I can understand how the Japanese economy recovered. Because, you know, their vector was different from that of Europe. Europe got martial aid. Japan didn't get the same degree of economic assistance. And so I'm trying to understand how, how did they uh, develop, especially in the period after the Korean War. So you can, I, I, I'll make good this point about Japan. It's a very important one. And I'll be doing another report on the global economy. I'm really by, by training and by preference a student of economics. So I'll be doing something on that. And then, then I think I'll be able to give more of a fair treatment to Japan. I, I take your point. I see, Jay, I only want to say, look, these are all building blocks. If you're ready to, if you're ready to fight right now, and you know violate Chinese territorial waters, why not? But what if China were to attack Quimoy, for example? You have really, I don't know of anybody who has any contingency plans. Maybe the maybe the Americans and Japanese do, because when if any of these are implemented, you can bet that the Chinese will launch some kind of attack on Quimoy. What are we going to do? So what you want to do is build up gradually and push back. At the moment, there is no pushback. There's only this that, you know, oh, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is how we have to defend and so on. On why not Tibet as, a, as not a part of the PRC, I have been in favor of this for as long as I can remember. I think the reason is that we have not yet got over the 1962 syndrome. This is my, this is my understanding. Um, and we are doing nothing to get over it. You know, if you are hamstrung by a military imbalance, then how about correcting that imbalance? But I, I, I don't see that being done. And all I am seeing is that the gap is 
widening constantly. So that I think that is the answer. All right. Yes. Uh, Can I, very small thing because I don't want you to divulge the national secret, but you have been. I to, don't have any. No, but you have been advisor to three successive prime ministers, and your responsibility was foreign and defense policy. And it's very important can issue. Taken and after nuclear so policy. Nuclear power also. Yeah. So can you say that when all these were happening and we are talking about today, I'm not saying that you could talk directly, but if you can enlighten what went on in South Park. Maybe later, after <laughs> okay. that. After. Thank uh, you. No, no, <laughs> lastly, uh, lastly, I have uh, some uh, uh, comments and questions of my own. Sure, uh, because sure. as I said, that it's, uh, it has been a delightful experience for me as well. You know, uh, the first is a comment. The question arises, I think many people have uh, directly or indirectly raised this issue of why is it that China is treated the way it is treated by the international community? Why is it that everybody believes in China? Why is it that so many countries deal with China with what we would call kid gloves? After all, So some of the answers, of course, have uh, already been given. I would not like to go into them. But the other deeper answer, and which I think uh, lies rooted in history, is that you know the Sinophilia goes back to 17th and 18th centuries, as far as the West is concerned. You see, uh, when uh, Europe started uh, moving out on the explorations, uh, explorations and uh, this uh, colonial occupations, and they started sending out people, you see that from the 17th and 18th centuries a large number of uh, European missionaries, especially the Jesuits, they had settled there. And in Europe, it was an age of conflict. And in Europe, it was also an age of uh, religious tensions, intolerance, etc. And uh, as far as China is concerned at that time, under the Qing dynasty, it was a united, solidified, solidified large state, apparently well-governed. This is one reason that this impression of China being something larger than life, being greater than any other country in the world, that impression got created in the West over the 17th and 18th centuries. The statement you make about uh, Napoleon saying that the dragon is sleeping there, don't wake the dragon because then the dragon will, uh, you know, the shake dragon the will world. shake the world. Yeah. Yeah. Again, because you see, uh, Napoleon was under the influence of this... Uh, you know, thought that had already emerged there. Now, the fact of the matter, of course, is, as we know, the Qing dynasty was a foreign dynasty. They, the king were the Manchus, and they con continued to regard themselves as foreigners. And in fact, the Chinese nationalists in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and to this day, Absolutely. regard the Manchus as foreigners. Absolutely. In 1925, they dug out the grave of Empress Dowager, because they regarded her the greatest uh, empress in the history of modern China, because they regarded her as a foreigner. They regarded the Manchu rituals as foreigners. So China trying to get its borders, coterminous with the borders of the king, would be something like India trying to get the same borders as the British had or maybe the Mughals had. Uh, the Mughals ruled over uh, much of Afghanistan and, you know, they ruled over Kabul, etc., etc. I have never seen in the history of the modern world, in the history of the modern world, there isn't another country that not only occupies another territory, which is Tibet. Before the, the Chinese occupation of Tibet, we never had borders with China. We had borders with Tibet, as has rightly been said. So they occupied Tibet and consequently now we have borders with Tibet. So... Not only that, China also wants to fight over the borders that Tibet putatively had with other countries. So that's the second stage of aggression that we see here. Now, when we are faced with this kind of a power and that Sinophilia was passed on then to uh, the Indian educated classes, and of course it is reflected in uh, so many people as we know, when we are faced with this kind of a power, actually, which believes that it is a civilization nation and has never abided by international law at all. This is what the truth is. It has only paid lip service to international law, international treaties, etc., etc. Then the real question, as somebody here said, is, are we, either as India or any conglomeration of 
powers, whether in Asia, Quad, or any other uh, combination, are we really ready to uh, sort of uh, uh, exert ourselves uh, in terms of confronting China? Not in terms of, I, I, you rightly said, of course, I mean, these legal things will build up and they will help us. And I very well accept that. But the real fight there is economic and military. China needs to be convinced that, look, it cannot overcome the combined opposition of many countries. The reason China is not being convinced about this is because the West constructed a notion that the world was always Sinocentric. Like you see people like Martin Jacques saying when China rules the world. Well, the fact is, historians know China never ruled the world. And I'm damn sure China is never going to rule the world. But the fact is that the West has created this narrative. This narrative has been internalized by China itself and by the rest of the world. You see, when, when China believes that it was the Middle Kingdom, right there, you had Japan. Japan had its own emperor, it had its own language, it had its own civilization, its script. Japan never accepted China as the Middle Kingdom. It is only the small countries like Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, etc., etc., which regarded the Chinese emperor as their uh, suzerain or whatever you, know, you call it, tribute or anything else. India, of course, never accepted China as uh, anything superior. In fact, the Chinese described the India as the Western heaven. That's what the truth is. So what are we talking about? China was never the Middle Kingdom. The world was never Sinocentric. In fact, India had a far more important role uh, in, in Asia because of its uh, favorable geographic location. However, the problem is that China is now convinced of this narrative. It has internalized that the narrative that, it, that got created in the West. How to now wean away China from this narrative and convince it by demonstration of economic, military power and international unity that China must abide by international law, China must abide by international treaties, rules, regulations, otherwise it will have to pay a very, very heavy price for this. These are my questions, comments, whatever, if you may like to respond, I'll be happy. <laughs> I think the the there are two two angles that I would like to address. Uh, one is when you ask how do we confront China, and the answer is you can do it only in the same way that China has risen to where it is today, where it is able to confront not just the U.S. but pretty much every country around it singly or in combination and that is rapid economic growth and rapid investment in your military if you cannot do these two things then you cannot confront full stop now <clears throat> i think we i mean as i said i am a student of economics by inclination and training i do have a full blueprint of what India needs to do on the economic side in order to rise much faster than it is doing. It's doing pretty well, but the potential is much, much higher, much higher. And, you know, we have a structural advantage <laughs> which China never had, and that is a very high level of domestic demand. <laughs> so we are not dependent on export markets in order to grow fast. But the trouble is that we are not utilizing this advantage to the full. Now, I don't want to veer off into a discussion on the economy, but the point is that unless we can fix our economic growth to a much higher growth path and then spend a minimum of 3% of GDP on defense, Actually, I would say in the short run, it should be more like 4% of GDP to make up for the last 30 years. Then you really cannot confront because these are the sinews of global power, economic wealth and military power. So that, that is one point that I would address. Your other thing about why is China treated so well there are two parts to it, actually. And, you know, this is 
an open subject. It, I, I, I don't claim that I have reached the final conclusions on this. But two things do strike me. One, that everybody else is colluding in it. Now, you have made some excellent points about the historical reality. But are even we talking about it? From 1 AD to 1700 AD, India was the largest economy in the world. How many Indian economists even talk about this? And this is not an Indian student saying this. This has been written in the book by Angus Madison. In so fact, is the only one who has been no, in so, fact, Paul Baroque has given even higher. Paul Baroque has given another. Baroque's yes, estimates absolutely. are even higher. Exactly. But you don't hear us saying it. Now, that's one part. The other part, which is of more modern vintage, is the amount of money that China has thrown around the world, especially in the Anglo-Saxon world. Newspapers, televisions, films, think tanks, Congress, everywhere they are throwing money as if it's going out of fashion. Books have been written about it. The Australians have done a very thorough examination of this and written about it in detail. What are we doing? Zilch. Even when we send someone to the so-called Nehru centers, even those guys don't know the reality of India. So, you know, our message, I mean, I've said this right through, our messaging has been extremely poor and really needs to be lifted up. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Shukla, for that delightful lecture. Uh, I will request everybody to hold on for a moment. Uh, I just wanted to announce our uh, schedule of uh, seminars and lectures for the next one month. On 26 October 2021 at 3 p.m., we have a public lecture by Professor Raghuvendra Tamar on the unfolding of a tragedy, key issues in the story of India's partition. On 29th October, we have a seminar uh, in which Professor Raja Mohan, Director, Institute of South Asian Studies, will be speaking on changing geopolitics of the Indian Ocean. And uh, we have another lecture by Dr. Sonali Mishra on 10th November. The topic of the lecture is yet to be announced. And then we have a lecture on 16th November by Professor Sanjay Srivastava from Banaras Hindu University, who will be speaking on India's soft power and public diplomacy strategies. On 18th November 2021, we have a public lecture in which Ambassador Sujan R. Chinoy, Director General of ITSA, will be speaking on India and China in a changing world order. And finally, on 30th November, we have a public lecture by Ambassador Dinka Srivastava on forgotten Kashmir, the other side of the line of control. So I would request uh, the participation of those who are here and uh, those who have joined us online in uh, these lectures as well. And uh, may I now announce that tea is also wait waiting outside. It has been a long session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.